business partnership astrology. In this video, I'm going to tell you what you need to be looking for in the astrology charts if you want to make sure that you have the best possible business partnership. So let's do it. All right, this is Dr. V with Astrology Alpha for the entrepreneurially minded, and we're looking at business partnerships. How can we use the astrology to find out which business partnerships work, what you should be looking for in the charts, what doesn't work, and all the rest. So business partnerships, or let's say partnerships in general, are a great area for using astrology. It's one of the areas where astrology shines the most, which is also why for centuries and millennia, people have been consulting astrologers when they wanted to understand whether a particular partnership is beneficial for them, whether it's auspicious, especially people have been doing this obviously for marriage and romantic partnerships to this day in many places like China or India especially, people regularly, routinely consult an astrologer before they marry because they want to know whether the synastry works out well or not. There's lots of different techniques in astrology like synastry, composite charts, Davison charts, all of that. But what I'm going to talk about today specifically is the synastry chart in business partnerships and specifically what you should be looking for in a good business partnership. When you're looking at a chart, you have all kinds of different aspects. You have harmonious aspects and positive aspects, which are the trines, the sextiles, you know, everything which is kind of soft and smooth and flowing. And then you have hard and challenging aspects. So that's your squares and the oppositions and sometimes the conjunctions, depending on what forces uh, are coming together there. So those are aspects that are more challenging and that are difficult, that create tensions and hurdles and obstacles that you need to overcome because there's these differences between people, right? So now the question is, when you look at a synastry, specifically between business partners, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a chart or a synastry where you have only positive and harmonious aspects, as many as possible, ideally. Is that what you're looking for? No, that's not what you're looking for. Why? Because if you have only harmonious aspects, what tends to happen is that the relationship will become sort of boring or it will not have a lot of dynamism. It will not move much. It won't have a lot of challenges that you can use to actually grow from, right? So it'll feel good to, you know, to know this person, it'll be everything is smooth and nice and so on. But oftentimes what you see happen in reality, when you have people who only have more, you know, harmonious aspects, it's kind of, they don't get really triggered. Sometimes the relationship doesn't even start or it's not, there's no impetus or no kind of trigger. There's no spark that ignites the relationship. You know, it's just like, okay, oh, it feels nice to be around this person, but you know, that's it. You forget them. Whereas when you have some challenging aspects, some tensions, some hard aspects, that's when you have development and evolution being triggered. So that's when, you know, the one person kind of drives you crazy a little bit and you're like, oh, yeah, this is always, always again with this. But then you're kind of, right, because of that challenge, you are actually driven to do something with this person or evolve together. Obviously, if you have too many challenges, that's going to lead to, uh, a breakdown of the relationship, right? That's basically not going to lead to any, any successful outcome. You want the right mix. Okay, so I'm going to show you in practice with a couple of examples from famous uh, business partnerships, well-known business partnerships, how this works in practice and what it looks like when it works well. All right, so let's look at the charts. Right, so the first business partnership that I'm looking at is Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak at Apple, uh, you know, these guys co-founded Apple and obviously been extremely successful. They've founded what is essentially now the most valuable company on the planet. 
the most valuable company in the history of, of companies. So this is going to be an interesting case to look at. Famously, they had a lot of tensions amongst each other around certain things, but then also, uh, you know, obviously extremely productive and creative partnerships. So let's look at their charts and let's see the synastry between them. All right, so let's have a look at the chart. We got Steve Jobs here in the middle in sight and Steve Wozniak on the outer circle. So what do we see when we look at the synastry? First thing is, right, there seems to be a lot of kind of significant uh, touch points and let's see what they are. So we've got the sun here, conjunct Jupiter. So this is Steve Jobs' sun conjunct, pretty much exactly conjunct Steve Wozniak's Jupiter. This is an, an aspect which is extremely empowering, which is all about trust, basically. So when you have Sun conjunct Jupiter with somebody, it means that the belief of one person, what one person believes in, is identical to the personality of the other person, right? So what the core of your faith and your belief, which is Jupiter, is identical to the personality of the other person, right? And what the conscien conscious experience of the other person is. So in consequence, when you have this, this, this synastry aspect, you're going to have extreme level of trust between each other, right? So almost like blind and complete trust. And this is obviously very good for business partnerships. One of the best aspects you can have in a business partnerships. But then that's not the only one these guys also have here. You see the Venus conjunct Jupiter. So this is actually part of another, you know, a couple of other planets. So you got Jupiter Uranus in Steve Jobs' chart, which is like the, you know, the quintessential Promethean technological revolutionary, which is Jupiter Uranus that Steve Jobs is born with and, you know, that he's, Play such an important role with. Actually, there's another thing to look at in future, but all of Steve Jobs' important breakthroughs, they came on the Jupiter-Uranus uh, cycle, different kind of uh, sections and parts and phases of the Jupiter-Uranus cycle and activations of the cycle. But anyway, so he's got this, right? He's the Promethean technological innovator, and you have this Venus conjunct moon, so kind of a very soft and supportive side of Steve Wozniak conjunct and especially you got the Venus conjunct Jupiter, which this is very, 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 very good, right? Typically, classically, you have the smaller benefic and the greater benefic. This is a marker of, you know, success, financial success, wealth, and, and all kinds of other kind of good fortune and luck coming uh, your way, basically. All right, so you have these kind of very empowering aspects in the chart, right? But what else do you have? You also have, you know, this is, as I was saying, you don't have just in, in, the, in a really good partnership, you don't have just the easy and empowering aspects. You also have here, they actually have a Mars opposite Mars, you know, Mars, Mars opposite Mars position here. Yeah, a Mars to Mars opposition is actually, karmically speaking, it's actually a marker of a uh, karmic, uh, rivalry, sort of like a past life rivalry, which is, which, you know, two people have incarnated to continue, you know, that energy can be used for productively, but it's also not necessarily easy. You know, there's going to be a lot of kind of butting of heads. And then you also have, additionally, you have here the Saturn of Steve Jobs' Saturn square, you see here, square Steve Wozniak's Pluto, and Sun, right? So Steve Wozniak's kind of very intense uh, way, of, a way of creating things, right? Creating technology specifically, uh, in his case, is, is square, so is, you know, is different to, and it's going to clash and be tense with the way that Steve Jobs establishes powerful structures in his life, right? And the way that he manages those powerful structures, Right? Specifically for Steve Jobs with the Saturn in, in uh, Scorpio, this was a lot about proprietary technologies, right? Having, owning proprietary technologies and, you know, communicating uh, through, you know, very, very well-designed uh, 
messaging systems, right? And this was all opposed to the intense creator mode of Steve Wozniak, right? The Leo son in, in Pluto, right? So what does that mean? Well, it, it means that they actually had uh, very prominent and big clashes on how to advance Apple eventually, right? Where Steve Wozniak more wanted to do something about just focus on the technological innovation, whereas Steve Jobs wanted to focus on the proprietary tech and the messaging and so on and so forth, right? And this, this actually eventually led to a falling out between them. This is a very difficult aspect. Saturn uh, square Pluto is really difficult, really, really difficult. It's one of these aspects which kind of over time tends to break down any relationship, even though, you know, no matter how many good things you have there, or it's, at least it's very difficult to keep going on. But as you can see here, as I was uh, mentioning, as what we want to look for, you've got, you know, these hard aspects, difficult aspects, and you've got the very empowering and very, very positive aspects. And they're mixed nicely together to give you this super powerful synastry in a business partnership. This is what you want to look for in business partnerships. All right, so let me give you some more examples. Right, the next one is I'm going to talk about Martin Scorsese and his partnership. Actually, both of them, his partnership with Robert De Niro, which is super famous, right, where they made some great classics, right? He made, they started with Mean Streets and they made Taxi Driver and Raging Bull and then, you know, the legendary Casino and Goodfellas you know, with Joe Pesci in the mix and eventually all the way up to the Irishman. They just made, you know, so many classics together. But at some point in his career, Martin Scorsese started to make movies with Leonardo DiCaprio. And with him, then he had another string of huge classics, right? The, the Wolf of Wall Street, The Departed, uh, Shutter Island, and, you know, you name them. And they're all, you know, they've both actually been in the recent uh, Killer's uh, of the movie, the what's it, what's it called? I don't even know. I can't even recall it. I haven't seen it yet. The uh, the killer. Oh, come on, what's it called? Killers of the Flower Moon. Killers of the Flower Moon. That's it. Exactly. Killers of the Flower Moon. Where where I gotta. I need to watch that. Where it's Robert De Niro and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio together in a Martin Scorsese flick. So let's look at the the sinistry. This is gonna be really interesting for us, right? Um, this got to be interesting. So let's start with Martin Scorsese and uh, and Robert De Niro. Okay, so this is Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro. Okay, so what do we see? Well, we see a couple of very harmonious aspects right away. You got moon, conjunct moon, right? What is this? This is about feeling, you know, the same way about things. This is basically, you know, you're instinctively and intuitively have the same feeling, right? The same, you feel, you understand how the other person feels instinctively. You kind of tune in emotionally with the other person, right? You kind of get in sync with each other emotionally all the time, right? This is, feels, this is super like a feel-good aspect to have in a partnership, any type of partnership, right? It just makes things very, so much more easier emotionally to have good moon aspects. Right? And then what else? They also have Mercury, sextile Mercury, you see here. So whenever you have a harmonious aspect between Mercury and Mercury, it means, well, they're going to communicate well, very easily, smoothly. They're going to communicate, right? They're a little bit different how they communicate, you know, from Scorpio to Virgo, but, but it flows very well with each other, right? It's like an easy flow. And then you also have the Venus, uh, sextile Venus. So Right? Their aesthetic sense is also uh, very compatible with each other. So a lot of, you see, a lot of compatible and harmonious things. They're actually, you know, these guys are um, almost the same age, like very close in age, which is why the generational planets, the large planets, they're conjunct each other, right? You, this is always the case if somebody's basically the same year or just one year uh, different to you, right? That the generational planets, they're going to be conjunct each other. So... That already adds a lo level of similarity, right, into the relationships. But, but then there is this, this sun, square, sun, exact sun, square, sun, 
right? Exact sun square sun, which this is the tension that I'm talking about, right? This is some, some big tension that's going to arise. Normally you say, okay, sun, square sun, uh, they're very different. Personalities are very different. They're going to do things super different and they're going to clash about it all the time, right? But when you have this embedded in a chart like here, then that can be good, right? That can be good. This is what I mean by the creative tension that you want in a chart that is actually helpful. So in this case, you got uh, Robert De Niro with his Leo son. You know, he wants to express and live and just be, you know, the creative process. And you got Mars Scorsese with his, with his Scorpio son. He wants to be the, you know, the super kind of meticulously designed and very you know, deeply thought through process that he wants to control every aspect of, right? So, so this is very typical, the director and the star, right? Or the Scorpio and, and the Leo, right? And we're doing, we're going to clash all the time around, you know, because both are very powerful signs, right? Both are about power in some ways, but Scorpio is about hidden power and Sun, you know, and sorry, Leo is about visible power, right? So hidden power versus visible power, they're going to clash a lot. But because they have all of these other things, because they emotionally totally get each other, right? Because they have the, they speak, you know, in a super compatible way. They have a similar compatible aesthetics, right? Uh, it's, and then also the generational stuff, you know, that they're from the same generation, seeing things the same way. It's going to work out well, right? That tension is actually going to be used to bring a lot of movement into the relationship and make the business partnership better. All right, so now let's have a look at Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese and see how the saga continues and how the relationship between the two plays out. So Martin Scorsese here is actually, you know, very interesting here. It's uncanny how he went and he found an actor who is, like 30 something years younger, but who is super similar to himself, right? He's really similar. He's like, it's like, look at their pictures. They also, oftentimes when they're together, they kind of totally sync up. He's super similar. The sun is on, you see this here? The sun is on the sun. Mars is on Mars. Yeah. And Venus is on Venus. So it's like, right? They're like this, the same type of personality. They act the same way. They think the same things are beautiful, right? And very odd kind of alignment of two people who are, you know, so they have such an age difference, but then so similar, right? In, in, in some very fundamental and essential things. But then, right? Okay, actually, so where are the tensions between these guys? Now, here's the thing. These guys are obviously not from the same generation, so their generational planets are going to be very different, right? Their generational planets, the big ones, you know, the ones that move slowly, they're going to be very, very different. So you've got here Leonardo DiCaprio's Neptune opposite the Saturn and Uranus of uh, Martin Scorsese, right? So this is basically the... Uh, here, Leonardo DiCaprio believes in, or he has this, he's kind of part of these, these uh, ideals, right? Sagittarius Neptune is ideals, so ideals like, uh, you know, climate change and, and protection and uh, sustainability or whatever the case may be. And this, this is part of his generation's uh, ideals, and this is super different to how uh, Martin Scorsese manifests and builds things and is also, you know, has his, is also opposed somehow to Martin Scorsese's networks, right, which is his Uranus in, in, and Saturn in Gemini, right? But this opposition, this opposition actually, you know, can be a creative spark for them, right? Because this is a generational opposition. So he's like, okay, you know, those things that you're doing is so different and opposed to all the people that I know and everything that I'm a part of. But, you know, somehow it's going to give them a spark of inspiration, right? It can give them a spark of inspiration. Apart from that, you actually don't have that many hard aspects here. So this is, this is actually a case where, you know, these guys are mostly, you know, because of the great similarity that they have here, 
right? That's why they work well together. This is a peculiar case, seems like Martin Scorsese. Uh, <laughs> you know, probably he was fed up with Robert De Niro doing his thing, and he went and looked for somebody who was like, you're going to do things exactly the way I tell you to, and, and he found somebody who's going to say, yes, sir, and, and that's what happened with the two of them. So, but, you know, it worked for them. They made a couple of really good movies, and, and that's another case of a good uh, and very interesting partnership astrology and a partnership synastry. All right, so that's two cases where I already made, you know, I explained to you, I showed you how, how you want to have a nice mix between the, the harmonious aspects, the empowering aspects, right, and some, some challenges and some tensions that come in the mix and that kind of mix things up. And now I'm going to show you still another case for how this can go wrong Right? If, if the tensions or if the difficult aspects are a little bit too much. Right? So let's look at the next example. So this is the next example. And it's Sammy the Bull Gravano and John Gotti. So John Gotti, he was a famous, super famous mob boss in the 80s, the Gambino family that he led. And, you know, the Dapper Don and Sammy Gravano, he was his right-hand man and his underboss, you know, street boss, something like that. And, and, you know, there's a lot of stories about them. You know, they rose to fame together, to great power together. And eventually, Sammy Gravano ratted on him. He became a government witness, right? He became a government witness in the, in the mob. Uh, that's kind of the worst thing you can do. And after that, he actually, now he's going on show. He's still around. He's doing shows with, he's doing podcasts with Patrick Bat David and other people like that. And yeah, this is an interesting story. If you watch the movie, don't watch the, the movie that John, John Travolta played. You know, there's three movies about John Gotti. Uh, the one with Armand, that's the best one. You know, this one, this is the one you want to watch. Armand DeSanti, that's the, that's the best one. And, you know, the John Travolta one is, unfortunately, yeah, it's not good. But, yeah, let's look at the Sinistry. All right, so this is the Sinistry. And between John Gotti and Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano. So, you see here, you got John Gotti in the middle. And you got Sammy Gravano outside. So... What do we have here? We've got, well, the first thing that you notice right away is, you know, you got again here the Jupiter-Venus conjunction, right? Which is what? It's about wealth, right? Wealth kind of, this is the bringer of fortune and wealth, right? The great benefic and the smaller benefic. And this is not just one way. This is basically two ways because even though this is a wide conjunction here, right? This is 10 degrees, but still because... You know, when you have kind of factors doubled up, then they, they count special. This is a double whammy. You got the Jupiter Venus both ways. So this is basically going to be a, you know, a very fortunate relationship for wealth creation, and which is obviously what they did. And then, you know, you've got the Mars, trine Mars. This is pretty good. Mars trine Mars means that the way that you act and the way that you get things done is in flow with each other, right? It's very kind of, you can pass the ball to each other and very effectively and efficiently get things done together, which is always good to have in partnerships. So this is some good, good, good stuff, right? But then we have a couple of difficult uh, aspects. First is we've got here the Pluto square Saturn and actually Saturn and Jupiter. So Sammy the Bull Gravano's power or what he perceived as his power, right? His is is opposed to the social structures, Sam Gotti's social structures. Basically, what is this Jupiter, Saturn? This is basically the the structure that Sammy that John Gotti has has manifested and created the entire Gambino family, basically. The, so Sammy Gravano's power is, is going to clash with that or his pursuit of power, his own, 
his personal pursuit of power is going to clash with that. And then you have as well, and I said it before, Pluto square Saturn is one of the hardest aspects, or Pluto, especially Pluto opposite Saturn, is almost always going to lead to some type of breakdown in the relationship. And, and even, you know, it doesn't mean that every relationship with that aspect is doomed, but every relationship would have go, will have to go through, through some type of breakdown, right? And if, then if it's still healthy, if it's still, you know, it's meant to be, then you can come back together again and so on. But you got to be ready for some type of breakdowns at some point. And then, well, here you also have the sun opposite Neptune here. See, our sun opposite Neptune. This is not something you want to have in a business partnership. Neptune you know, square your Mercury or opposite your Mercury, opposite your sun. It's not so good at all because this means basically what, you know, illusion, delusion, deception is Neptune. Neptune in the low sense, right? When you're spiritually advanced, then Neptune becomes more like uh, spiritual enlightenment. But, you know, these guys probably not very spiritually advanced. And Neptune opposite Sun, so the personality of the other person, right? Who they are, who they are, op op you know, in opposition to uh, deception and illusion, right? This is basically a, a very clear marker of uh, a possible deception taking place between them. Obviously, there's going to be more markers for this. I'm making it a little bit simple right now because there's so much more in the chart. There's asteroids that you need to look at the composite, the Davison charts, and so on, and to get the full picture. But this is still useful just so you start to understand some individual aspects, what you want to look for, and how you can start to think about a productive and a good business partnership astrology. Right? So let me recap this. What you want to look for is some empowering aspects, right? Some harmonious aspects between Mercury and Mars and, uh, you know, and Sun. And for instance, between uh, Saturn and Sun, you're going to have a lot of stability between Saturn and, and, and Jupiter. If you have a harmonious aspect, you're going to build something slowly that takes shape between Jupiter and Sun. You're going to have a lot of trust. Between Mercury and Mercury, you're going to have a very good communication flow, right? Those are all good aspects to have in a business partnership. Between Moon and Moon, you're going to get to each other emotionally, not, you know, really like being in the same team, on the same boat, you know, feel like you're part of the same team. And those are all good aspects to have. And if you have enough of those, then you can counteract to have some hard aspects, some tense aspect. You actually want a couple of hard aspects because that makes you then grow and that gives you the challenge to work on yourself and to evolve in that partnership. But again, if you have too many of those hard aspects, right, if they outweigh, then, you know, things are going to go south eventually. So that's what you should be looking for in business partnership astrology. Now, in the next videos, I'm going to be looking at so much more. We can look at you know, individual aspects, what are the best aspects. We can look at how to use composite and Davison charts, which is when, you know, look at the merger of, of two. And there's so many other aspects and so many other things to look at in entrepreneurial and business astrology. If you have a specific interest in any of these, let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know in the comments how this worked out for you when you had good business partnerships and then you analyze the charts. You know, can you confirm what I say? You know, do you, does it work for you if you have some hard aspects or, you know, do you rather have no hard aspects in, in your experience? Let me know about your, about your experiences in the comments so we can have a convo about this. And I look forward to seeing you in the next videos. Be blessed. All the best. All the best.